Um, it's really great to see such a good crowd on a hot, hot night. Um, speaking of that, there's a little table buried back behind all these people that has waters on it and a little basket. We're asking for a dollar. If anyone wants some water, just throw a dollar in the basket. You can change out of it if you need it. Um, there's also some old articles courtesy of Bruce Byer. Uh, Buffalo's only Bruce Byer. <laughs> back there. Uh, be, be careful with them. They're newspaper. They're kind of old, but feel free to thumb through them and check them out. They're all on this case and related issues, and they're really interesting. Um, there is a restroom right here. Um, there are stairs to it, but you're free to walk up here anytime during the presentation, use it, whatever. Uh, this is Burning Books. Welcome to Burning Books. If you haven't been here before, we are your local radical bookstore. Um, friendly. Yes, yes. Very friendly local radical bookstore. So come in and check out. We have a whole lot of material on uh, issues very directly related to the presentation tonight and other freedom struggles. DVDs, CDs, lots of books, booklets, and we do a lot of events like this. So. Um, I'm going to be casting this nice basket. If anyone wants to get a donation to help cover Jeremiah's costs, our expenses, throw it in the basket. I'm also going to be passing around this is a mailing list. We send out a uh, email newsletter once a week. It's very clean. There's no spam, anything like that. And it'll just give you all the updates about events like this that we're having in here and also new materials we get in. Um, so anyone who's at all interested, please sign up for that. And I think that's all I got without any uh, further hesitation. <laughs> Here's Jeremiah. Good evening, friends and, and strangers, <laughs> and everybody who falls in between. There's <laughs> folks here that I haven't seen in 40 years. Folks that I've seen in 40, 40 years. I want her. I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, I don't think Chris is here yet. Christine, yes. I knew her as a, as a girl. Yeah. Anyway, long story short, uh, she convinced me that this could happen tonight. Um, and what further convinced me was the need for these, for history that I'll be talking about, personal and a little bit more general tonight, that's been really forgotten or ignored or mythologized. Uh, I'm talking about the map board uh, ripoff era, shall we say. Um, and the best way I can kind of introduce that, I hope, given the technology and my misunderstanding of it, uh, is to run a little clip of a documentary that's, that's almost complete, I'm told, by a filmmaker in Baltimore. Baltimore is kind of the birthplace of the Catholic radical left draft board ripoff movement, such as it was. Um, it started with Phil Berrigan and three others in Baltimore, a group called the Baltimore Four. They went into, oh, I should stop. It's kind of in this trailer. It's a trailer for the movie. It's called Hit and Stay, which, by the way, is one thing we didn't do. I <laughs> <laughs> just did the first part. <laughs> Failed at it and got stayed. <laughs> but this is, this I think, will give you a very good introduction to the, those of you who don't know remember or don't know what this thing is all about, what the movie is all about. So, further presentation. In our history books, in our classrooms growing up, just in public school, this stuff is written out. It's not even a blip in history, in those history books. But the height of the Vietnam War, nine Catholics entered this white frame building in Catonsville, Maryland. It was a draft board. The nine seized selective service files. They brought those files out into this parking lot and then burned them with the help of homemade napalm. They stayed and waited for the cops to come because they wanted to be known that they were witnessing. They were breaking the law and they were breaking the law because there was a greater law. We destroyed property that came to school. And people get very, very flustered over that. They forget about the destruction of human beings, but they say if they got violent over property, they burned those papers. It was up in the ante a little, but safely and still within the realm of nonviolence. But when property is destroyed, and a lot of it deserves to be destroyed in order to illustrate the way it is employed to abuse and to kill and maim human beings. 
is a sense of immediacy about it that, of course, draft records are hunting licenses. But of course, the striking thing about the Catonsville Nine, this wasn't your usual protest with scruffy, you know, anti-war demonstrators, young men trying to avoid the draft. The Catonsville action was nine Catholic lay people and clergy. And I think that reached out to a community beyond the conventional anti-war activists. It made the Catholic community, no matter how conservative, question, because these were priests and former nuns. Not only am I not religious, but I find religion to be distracting and kind of a bummer. But um, these folks are different. That was the most expressive, most uh, mobilizing thing I've seen as far as the anti war movement was concerned. The numbers in the streets that we could sustain from that moment on would have been impossible without actions like the King's Own Line and Baltimore IV. The Baltimore and Catonsville actions certainly influenced me, and that led to my own participation in several practical actions. We committed five federal felonies. That was my little claim to fame, to be the first nun in the United States to commit a federal felony. The question was, uh, when I would be involved in the movement. I remember uh, talking to somebody in the seminary, uh, a priest, and I uh, said, well, uh, how do you see your life in the upcoming years? And they said, well, I'll eventually be in jail. He said, oh, that's interesting. We rendered literally hundreds of draft boards inoperable for months or years or the rest of the war. And the director of the Selective Service acknowledged that these actions had really undercut their ability to operate. By engaging in a standby action, we were very much trying to, yes, stop the war, or in particular, prevent 501A draftees from being drafted. But we also were very much looking ahead to the courtroom to be able to press our case to a wider audience. There were these very threatening people. I remember one comment of the prosecutor, these people are a greater threat to the security of this nation than is organized crime. There were sometimes 25, 30 people went in, in places. Some people did eight, nine, and ten actions. You know, that's the story that of the, of the history of the county that needs to be brought up. They epitomize people putting their bodies on the line, willing to go to jail for something they believe in. I, did, I had to do 18 months in prison. 25 months. 14 months. 21 months. Well, I together 15 months. Spent 18 months. I got five years maximum. I ended up spending about 11 months. You're a nun or a priest, you've been through the convent, you've been through the seminary. It's perfect training for being in prison. <laughs> Unfortunately, there weren't any demonstrations. At least they were very small demonstrations uh, as the U.S. first got into Vietnam. By the time we got into Iraq, before the war began, there were hundreds of thousands of people on the streets. That's that's what this, they, that's what the kids built that did. That's how it changed the consciousness of the whole generation of the whole country. I mean, you constantly read that there's no protest over Iraq, but there's a over Vietnam. That's got the story backwards. Uh, the Iraq War is the first war in Western history that I can think of. Where there was massive protest before it was officially launched. It's like peace is almost a dirty word. I don't know. It's like a country based on the Westerns, where instead of talking to a guy, you shoot him. There's no such thing as just war. What corrupts everybody who engages in it? Everybody becomes bad in war. some things to say about it, and I think it's a, a I've always thought it was a, a shame that people didn't know more about the, the rip-off actions, as we call them. Um, and that's why I'm here. And what I, what I, I don't have anything to sell yet. I've got a, I'm calling it a memoir in the making about these, these days. Uh, and what you'll find, I hope tonight, is a, a kind of a, a backgrounder of what it was like to be involved in 
things kind of action. And also, um, it's an opportunity to talk a little bit about some of the, the costs, the personal costs that uh, accrue to the action. Uh, that accrue to every action or any action when parents and, and children disagree for reasons such as we've just seen. This part of this presentation focuses on my relationship with my dad. So, to start, let's see how far we go. <clears throat> it, was a, it was a dark and steamy night. <laughs> and I'm standing in a vast, darkened office lined with row after row of filing cabinets. It's a hot August night in 1971. I'm wearing only BBDs and t shirt I'm sweaty and dirty with dust that's older than I am. Somehow I have to open these filing cabinet drawers. That's what I'm here for. I tug on one drawer, tug on another, another. They're all locked. Shoot. <laughs> there are children anyway. <clears throat> While trying to keep panic at bay, the office darkness suddenly explodes in pulsating red light. I know where, I'm com I know where it's coming from and exactly what it means. Though my body feels frozen in place, I force myself to move to the office windows. I peer down at the street, two stories below. Half a dozen police cars crowd the curb and sidewalk. The light from their spinning cherry tops fills the room. Oh, God, no. No, 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 no. But yes, undeniably, irrevoc irrevocably, utterly, yes. In the corridor outside the office, I hear faraway shouts and the that are lost against the echoing stone walls of the people like building. I step into the corridor. I walk to a corner room down the hall. Another man is there. Chuck. We stare at each other as if we've never met. We're both shaking, shivering in our shared knowledge of what awaits us. We'd arrange to meet here if anything went wrong. Something is going wrong. We grin stupidly at each other. One of us starts to whistle. This was a deliberate strategy we talked about beforehand. The idea was to humanize ourselves so if we were prematurely discovered, a battalion of gun-toting cops wouldn't feel threatened by us. Who, after all, could shoot a pair of half-naked, dust-covered guys trying to whistle the Colonel Bogey March in unison? <laughs> but our whistles wouldn't work. Puffering was impossible. <laughs> We sound like a pair of dying, gasping parrots. <laughs> the noise brings a pair of cops bursting through the doorway. They look as scared as we do and jumpy, which was not a good thing. I don't remember if they had their guns out. We raise our hands anyway. They grab us and push us out of the corridor and into the corridor that's now ringing with the shouts and the slap of rushing feet. The cops throw us down on the terrazzo floor and cuff our hands behind our backs. Their blood's up. They call us a few choice names. One of the cops figures it out. Draft board readers, huh? Freaking draft board readers. That had been the idea, officer, <laughs> before you arrived. <laughs> to empty the selective service offices of all draft records. And while we were at it, we thought we'd steal files from the Army Intelligence Office then, just down the hall. That had been the plan before you guys came along before it all went wrong, or as events later demonstrated, before it all went right. I'm going to attempt a few illustrations here. Did you actually tell them you were going to also read the... Uh, no, 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 that was, that was poetic, um, <laughs> 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 Two. 
how to break into a federal office building in broad daylight. About the BBDs. And as I said, it was a hot night, but not that hot. The problem facing us, the problem the seven of us solved by stripping down, wasn't about comfort, but sound. The old post office building that housed the bath boards was a gorgeous turn of the century rock pile with a glass skylight and a hollow center. The building was a vast echo chamber. The rustle of our bell bombers, one leg squishing against the other, was as thunder to our hyper anxious minds. So, off came the genes. The post office building was our stage. Who were the actors? And how did we find ourselves in such strange circumstances that night? exactly the term we use to describe ourselves. Not actors in the sense of people pretending to be someone they really weren't for the benefit of an audience. No, actors in the sense of people being people who forget. That's what we were up to that night. And what we called an action, everybody else in the world called a crime. So we put it this way, we were up to no good in the name of greater good. An audience was the last thing we were looking for. At least that way. Now, here's how you break into a federal office building in broad daylight. You don't. You don't have to. You just walk in during business hours. And that's what we did that Saturday morning, one by one. Walked right past the guard at the main entrance. Taped to our bodies, tucked up our sleeves, and stashed in our pockets were such uh, were an array of implements such as altered fun reports, <laughs> plastic bottles of black dye, and one of us had an inflatable kitty's swimming pool. I'll explain later. Walking into the old post office was a piece of cake. Getting out of the old post office proved to be much more difficult. Though for two of us, not all the So there, it, so there I was Saturday morning, freshly shorn of my hippie locks, looking as straight as I ever did while attending Canisius High School. Some of you may have heard of that. Class of 68. <clears throat> my heart was doing backflips as I ran up three sets of marble stairs to the building's top floor, where I scuttled up a wrought iron staircase that led to the building's attic. This would be our area until the sun went down. Seven of us spent the afternoon and evening quietly talking our way in and out of a sense of impending doom. It happened that I was intimately familiar with that dark, filthy attic. I'd spent the previous weekend there together with a fellow named Jim Good. We needed to case the building from the inside to make sure that uh, to make sure when and how often the night watchman made his rounds, and most importantly, when and if he not gone. So our plan called for us to spend the weekend in the attic, walk in Saturday morning before the building closed at noon, and to walk out on Monday morning when the building reopened at night. Boredom seemed to pose the most obvious threat to our world. Casing an empty building hardly seemed a challenge, but as things developed, we had more component, a more compelling problem. Our friend and co-conspirator, Jim Martin, third member of our casing team, never made it up the attic stairs. He was perhaps the most critical member of our team. He was carrying a typewriter case full of sandwiches. <laughs> we found out later that Jim had decided to turn back when he saw the guard at the entrance randomly inspecting briefcases. It was a smart tactical move to bolt the premises, but it took a while for Jim Good and me to appreciate it. <laughs> the attic was a vast graveyard for decades of junk, mostly ancient and broken office furniture. The dust was so thick, the light so dim, that heaps of furniture looked like they were molding. This presented another problem. Jim and I realized a little late in the game that we needed to keep our street clothes as clean as possible for our Monday morning escape. So we stripped down to our skivvies as the line. <laughs> draped our clothes on a pile of hair sleeping office chairs. And we sat around trying not to think about lunch <clears throat> or dinner. After we clocked the night watchman's rounds and Monday finally rolled around, we put our clothes back on and inspected each other in the dim morning light. Neither of us cut reassuring figures. Clothes 
what it looked like we lived in the problem. Our faces said we just auditioned for a minstrel show. <laughs> Acting as each other's mirror, we spat on our hands and smeared the dust around our faces until we'd achieved the ashen look of zombies. <laughs> then, as office workers started flooding the hallway below, we, all the breath, scurried down the iron staircase that hadn't been used since Harding was present, <laughs> and joined the Manning crowd as it strolled reluctantly into another Monday workday. I wanted more than anything to run, wide-eyed and screaming into the morning sunshine. But I settled for a slow, hollow gallop. I think Jim was over my, the back of my pants and slowed me down. Yet, as I feared, a posse of federal agents was somehow on our tip on our heels. Uh, my running and screaming like a banshee through the hallways would only make us easier targets. When we finally hit the building's front steps, the sun was blinding. No one coming in or out of the office of the, uh, the building looked twice at the two squinting young coal miners standing there in the sport coats and khakis. Two of our fellows spotted us and hustled us to a waiting car, laughing almost as hard as we were with the roof. These, then, were the lessons of our overnight pacing. The ineptitude had gone unnoticed. No one knew about or cared about the act. We knew, we now knew that night watching was routine. We knew we could operate without interference for most of the night and all the next morning. <clears throat> the ripoff was on. It would be a piece of cake. And we'd learned our lesson. This time, we wouldn't borrow off all our sandwiches in one basket. <laughs> premises we've been lively tripping through all night. That must have been how Adam and Eve felt when they were banished from the garden. <laughs> but I didn't complain. Some surviving splinter in my brain told me these guards were not only the most glittering human beings I'd ever met, they were also the kindest. I had no idea why they didn't bust us on the spot on general principles. 
after a brief panic attack back at the dorm room, during which I feared I was, that the knowledge that was granted me by the tiny, amazing white pill would somehow turn me into a tomato, the acid buzz wore off and fell asleep and awoke to the memory of an evanescent new reality. I'd seen the light, I tasted it too, gobbled it up and hooked for more. I knew the secret of trees and dogwood blossoms. I had brought the secret of life itself. Seeing all sights and expressible sights, I swore I'd remember all my days. I vowed to keep this new understanding and shout it to the world. I would be the new messenger of psychedelic new titans. Here then is the secret of life itself. And I quote from memory. Everything is beautiful, man. <laughs> the grass, the streets, the trees, everything, you know? Something went far out. The electric prune said it much more eloquently than with guitars. I had too much to dream last night. And I never did figure out any way to express it. And though they were 400 miles away at the time, my parents had seen it coming. Overnight, I'd become a
dad and I had each discovered that summer, that summer an escape from the national tragedy that was unfolding every day in the evening news. We took refuge from the horror in our respective dreams of a generation of triumph. And we reacted with anger when either of us called the other out. And that's what we come to, my father and I. He was worried about it. He had a better sense of where I was headed than I did. I told him he didn't know where I was going. That it was up to me, I said. I told him I knew where I was going, even though I didn't have a clue. The fact was, I didn't want to have a clue. Wherever I was bound was fine by me. The world and all its dizzying dangers and pleasures and hopes and dreams had only just begun to crack open for me. I was ready to go wherever the wind blew me. All I asked for, all I expected, was that I had, had fun getting there. Dad had a vastly different road to travel, both of us knew it. While my world was opening up, his was closing down. His paths narrowed every day. He'd been diagnosed with kidney cancer six years earlier. On the fifth anniversary of his diagnosis, he was told that kidney cancer had been contained. Now he had leukemia. Dad had always been devoted to his work, and it was there that he found comfort. His job at that time was a thankless one, but he happily filled he was PR director of the hapless, cellar-dwelling 1969 version of the Buffalo Bills. His favorite joke while filming the PR tub for die-hard fans in the church basements and nights at Columbus Falls across Buffalo was in this year. The half-hour highlight film had been replaced by Polaroid. <laughs> it wasn't far from the truth. <laughs> Even when the Bills' ineptitude on the field won them the draft rights to the country's top college player, one O.J. Simpson. His job got no easier. People don't remember that Simpson was initially a bust. He had spent countless hours over the next couple of years counseling and comforting Simpson. He spent a lot of time, a lot more time working things out for Simpson, by my jealous measure, than he did for me. No doubt finding a way to help Simpson retain his threatened product endorsements was a lot easier to deal with than figuring out what his resentful, demanding son needed. What his demanding, resentful son would even accept if only he could figure out to walk. By the time Simpson had become a superstar, Dad was gone. Simpson couldn't be bothered to attend the funeral. By that time, in 1973, I had to fill in uh, the story a little bit further. Um, the uh, <clears throat> Many of you probably remember. Uh, <clears throat> that uh, less than two months after the arrests in Buffalo, um, a group of uh, individuals, some of us were a part of the planning for the original Buffalo Five, uh, came together and uh, plotted out three different um, place, uh, draft boards uh, in Batavia, Geneseo, and uh, Niagara Falls. And <clears throat> on, uh, on a night, um, October 2nd or 3rd, I can't remember the exact date now, uh, <clears throat> all <clears throat> at all three places uh, were entered um, approximately, well, in Geneseo there was 300, no, 800. Uh, draft files that were confiscated in uh, Batavia 700 in uh, Niagara Falls about uh, five to six hundred. They all came together in one place where uh, a group of us um, sent out letters to all the names that we had saying you can have your life back, you can do what you want with it. And um, uh, none of us were caught at those. Uh, and um, it, uh, you know, it was a direct. Uh, in fact, if Jeremiah remembers in the planning for the Buffalo Five, this also was in the works. Uh, and it became especially important, at least from my perspective, because after. Uh, the arrests in New Jersey and in Buffalo, Edgar Hoover 
sent out a statement saying the um, that they had broken the back of the East Coast conspiracy to save lives. And um, <clears throat> and so we started out our statement at those three places that we left there. We are the new and improved East Coast conspiracy to save lives. <laughs> and uh, so it was, I think one of the things you're trying to say that from, uh, from the film to the actions that kind of multiplied, uh, people um, kind of understood the, uh, the deep passion that so many of us had about this war. Uh, and uh, so I guess uh, I wanted to add that discussion. Space and paper was, you know, was a vertical. It was a, it was a top, top, what we call it, top item. So did you have, you had the success in terms of the, the original intent of the action, but not the notoriety that we were able to build on with our failure. One of those things. Yes, yes, absolutely. So in those days, once you had some of these carbon file and destroy them, the government found it difficult to get that person and bring them in? Or we never researched it. <laughs> <laughs> we all so, had our cards. They sent through the cards. Right, the no cards. problem. No. And, but there were files, and there were paper files. And, and if we didn't stop things, we certainly, if, if the raids didn't stop things, they slowed them down. I always thought it was a long sand machine. But, uh, and we didn't were imposing on anybody's rights. If you wanted to volunteer, they could just you know, run it anyway. So there was a Jim Martin fellow I mentioned about was involved in another action involving Curtis Tarr, who was then the director of Selective Services. And uh, Jim got his picture on the front page of the bunch of paper by getting knocked down by this guy. You know, Jim was flying through the air and his guy was six four something. Fine. Anyway, he was told, Jim was told, you guys you know, better start acting quickly with this crap board stuff because pretty soon all these records are going to be on computers. And we heard that and said, oh yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, I didn't explain the fondue forks. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, fondue forks, long, long things, and they've got double, double prongs. And we take one of the prongs off, but they have little wrinkles in them and stuff. And if you've ever tried to pick a lock, which until then I had, you know, I wasn't very good at it even with forks. You, you can, you know, stick it in the lock, and it got this little mooch thing on it. Anyway, it's a prong. Yeah. Okay. Lock die had a lot to do with the swimming. We knew there would be many tens of thousands of miles. And we didn't that we weren't going to burn them. And we didn't know that we had the strength to tear them successfully. So uh, we thought uh, we'd soak them in black dye, which would make them a easier to tear. We never tried it. You know. <laughs> and B, uh, make a big mess, which was okay, and obliterate whatever we weren't able to uh, you know, Once again, we kept the bags for years and years and using for laundry. <laughs> so they just deteriorated. They were cheap bags. I don't know what happened to laundry. What tipped off the guard that you were there with? The original tip came from a fellow named Bob Hardy in, in Hart in uh, Canada, New Jersey. He was a, a member of the group. He was a part of support. Uh, was a carpenter. In, in Canada, yes. And he was an informant. We didn't, they didn't know it, and they sure didn't know it. Uh, and uh, uh, he, he was in constant contact with the FBI, so the FBI had the Camden group completely covered. They were ready. When they, they waited until everybody got to the building, they, they, you know, they had the names and addresses of the support people. Oh, yeah. uh, in our case, the party had heard something, that something might be happening in public. That's all they had. And that night, uh, two guys, two FBI agents, surprised us by coming up the elevator 
they had Bermuda shorts on and flip flops. They were coming from a party. They were not really expecting to find it any more than we were expecting to see that. No, it was a head office. Well, yeah, but they were checking out the building just on the tip, on the, on the possibility that something was going down in Buffalo that in the building. But they didn't know what or where. And one of us didn't duck. What if we didn't? We didn't duck. We were spotted. I don't know. Do you know why they never arrested me? They didn't, they didn't have any evidence. I uh, came to my house. Did I say again? I came to my house looking that night. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, I know. There was there was stuff like that. Sure. Well, I think they, you know, Mike, the, Mike and Jim were there. Chairman is a bit too. Uh, volunteer. <laughs> You're guilty. <laughs> they were guilty. They were eager to uh, do what we were doing. They wanted to speak about it and stuff. And different times during the trial, they did stand up and say, claim responsibility. They said they'd, they'd been there. But was, all they found were two extra pair of pants. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if you've heard the story of Mike or not, but uh, these are two, two white guys who somehow scaled a wrought iron fence and got out the side door of this building and ran in their underwear down the east side, uh, looking for help. <laughs> and the east side was not, you know, it was rough territory, you know. Especially for two white guys running in my way. And I think Mike, Mike had to watch and used it as, as a, convince somebody to drive them to uh, the west side. Just in terms, in terms of Mike, Presenting his guilt, I can remember at the trial when that would happen. Everybody else would That's stand right. up and say, "Yeah, I was petty." <laughs> petty. <laughs> you know, it was a Spartacus thing. Yeah, yeah. You, you don't get shuffled out of the building and then you yeah. get back in. It was very frustrating for my people. The gyms were. They were just better climbers. Well, I don't know if you remember. Um, I had two roles that night, and. Uh, one of them was to, to drive a car because uh, there was some concern in the group uh, about the noise getting to the outside. As if you, I don't know if you had drills or something like that. And uh, so the parking lot across from the building, um, the upper level looked right into and um, so I was to wait for um, a signal coming from your building to the parking lot uh, to then take my car down in front of the building and push on the horn as long as I could. And uh, so I was looking and looking and <laughs> finally after quite a while, which I thought beyond the time when you were going to try and use the drills. Uh, so I went down in front of the, the uh, fire station there and uh, just, just uh, honking the horn for as long as I could until they, they came out. And so I just had my fingers crossed that it worked, that, uh, that it drowned out what was going on inside. The other, other uh, task that I had was to drive the, well, the, in the old term of the getaway car, but the, the van uh, to carry all the, uh, over the Grand Island. And uh, so I had, I had gone back to Grand Island after the horn hawking <laughs> and, uh, and waited to about the time that we had set about in, uh, in the morning, came back, as I was turning the street there, I saw it surrounded by about 50 cars. Yeah. And I said, I think I'd better get up there. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask about the Catholic connection. Yeah. In your group is the word Catholic. And you know, when I think about like the local diocese, I don't <laughs> see them supporting an action like this. So what was what was that all about? Well, it, it went back to uh, the Barrigans, really. They were they were uh, you know, figureheads, and the early actions were did involve a lot of priests, nuns, ex-priests, ex-nuns, 
and we were called the Catholic laity. It, it was a, a Catholic move, no, no question about it. But it wasn't approved by any diocese. <laughs> they weren't even close. I mean, even the Jebbies would have had trouble with it. And they did. You know, Dan was a Jesuit, and, and, and Phil was a, a uh, Josephine. And their orders were not too friendly. Although that changed too over the years. So it was not, it was certainly not an official part of the church. And, and it really put the church on notice for a lot of things. Is this organization still in exist? Or? Never an organization, more like an organism. <laughs> um, and it exists as you see it on that clip and here. You know, it exists in memory, and that's part of why I wanted to do this, was to just remind people about this forgotten history. When I saw those clips about boom, 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 you know, this city, that's it. I forgot. I didn't know a whole bunch of those actually. And they take place. People really missed a lot that We've got Howard Zinn and Owen Chomsky and all that stuff saying, yeah, we have a time. But it's better now. I'm just I'm glad to be able to uh, let people know a more personal level. Because it's, it was never a movement. We were really square. I mean, it was awful. You know, the Catholic thing, getting tagged with the Catholic thing. You know, schools, college kids. <laughs> What's this? You know, we like Quakers. Religious people just weren't cool in 1968, and I said, I have to also say that none of us really took the Catholic thing real deeply seriously in terms of our conscience. We were, we were young, you know, 20, 26, and it was a youth thing, and part of the appeal of the Buffalo action for me was that we didn't stand around and we didn't lie, because I thought that was square, too, and the counter, but the idea was to get away and do it again, and it was what Jim did. Other people, even other people uh, stuck around. So the the tactics kind of mutated. The, the bottom line is it was non-violent. Chairman, I, I think you're really right. I mean, your your script is is beautiful and and very important. Uh, the uh, George Michi, uh, um, was recently in Buffalo, uh, well, maybe it's close to a year now, but um, he's trying to do the same thing, uh, not only about what he was involved with, but a lot of others around the country. Um, and going back even you know, before the Vietnam War, and then afterwards, trying to bring all that together, um, and uh, I, I think that's very important. So I uh, congratulate you on uh, putting that together, and, and hopefully even more. Well, in this five chapters. I'll be back. Yes. Um, two questions. Uh, what effect did your participation in this trial and the action that you took have on your wife long term? And secondly, uh, okay, so we've done away with the draft, uh, except for the economic conscription that exists in this country. And how has that affected how you responded to the Iraq and Afghanistan war, and how the people in this room responded to the Iraq and Afghanistan war, or did not respond to it? Uh, fill in uh, the story a little bit further. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> many of you probably remember uh, <clears throat> that uh, less than two months after the arrests in Buffalo, um, a group of uh, individuals, some of us who were a part of the planning for the original Buffalo Five, uh, came together and uh, plotted out three different um, place, uh, draft boards uh, in Batavia, Geneseo, and uh, Niagara Falls. And on, uh, on a night, um, October 2nd or 3rd, I can't remember the exact date now, uh, all, at all three places uh, were entered um, 
approximately, well, in Geneseo there was 300, no, 800 uh, draft files that were confiscated. In um, Batavia, 700. In uh, Niagara Falls, about uh, five to 600. They all came together in one place where a group of us um, sent out letters to all the names that we had saying you can have your life back, you can do what you want with it. And um, uh, none of us were caught at those. Uh, and um, it, uh, you know, it was a direct, uh, in fact, the term I remember is in the planning for the Buffalo Five, this also was in the works. Uh, and it became especially important, at least from my perspective, because after uh, the arrests in New Jersey and in Buffalo, Edgar Hoover sent out a statement saying the, um, that they had broken the back of the East Coast conspiracy to save lives. And um, <clears throat> and so we started out our statement at those three places that we left there. We are the new and improved East Coast conspiracy to save lives. <laughs> and uh, so it was, I think one of the things you're trying to say that from, uh, from the film to the actions that kind of multiplied, uh, people um, kind of understood the, uh, the deep passion that so many of us had about this war. Uh, and uh, so I guess I want to add that one step. Space and paper was, you know, was a vertical. It was a, it was a top, top, what we call it, top item. So did you have, you had the success in terms of the, the original intent of the action, but not the notoriety that we were able to build on through our failure. One of those things. Ironically. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. So in those days, once you had somebody's card and file and destroyed them, the government found it difficult to get that person and bring them in? Or they never or researched it. <laughs> <laughs> we all had our cards. They sent through the cards. Right, the cards. Well, no. and, but there were files, and there were paper files. And, and if we didn't stop things, we certainly, if, if the raids didn't stop things, they slowed them down. I always thought it was throwing sand in the machine. But, uh, and we didn't weren't imposing on anybody's rights. If you wanted to volunteer, they could just you know, run it anyway. So there was a Jim Martin fellow I mentioned about was involved in another action involving Curtis Tarr, who was then the director of the Selective Service System. And uh, Jim got his picture on the front page of the bus paper by getting knocked down by this guy. And Jim was flying through the air and this guy was six four something. Anyway, he was told, Jim was told, you guys you know, better start acting quickly with this draft board stuff because pretty soon all these records are going to be on computers. And we heard that and said, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't explain the fondue forks. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, fondue forks, long, long things, and they've got double, double prongs. And we take one of the prongs off, but they have little wrinkles in them and stuff. And if you ever tried to pick a lock, which until then I had, I wasn't very good at it even with forks. You, you can, you know, stick it in the lock, and it's got this little nooch thing on it. Anyway, it's a lock thing. Yeah. Okay. Lock die had a lot to do with swimming. We knew there would be maybe tens of thousands of miles. And we didn't have, we weren't going to burn them. And we didn't know that we had the strength to tear them successfully. So uh, we thought we'd soak them in black dye, which would make them a easier to tear. Uh, 
I never tried it. <laughs> and B, uh, make a big mess, which was okay, and obliterate whatever we weren't able to uh, destroy. Once again, we kept the, the bags for years and years and used them for laundry. <laughs> So they just deteriorated. They were cheap bags. <laughs> I don't know what happened to find <laughs> What tipped off the guard that you were there with? The original tip came from a fellow named Bob Hardy in in, Hart, in uh, Camden, New Jersey. He was a, a member of the group. He was a part of the support group. Was a carpenter in, in Camden, yes. And he was an informant. We didn't, they didn't know it. We sure did know it. Um, and uh, uh, he, he was in constant contact with the FBI, so the FBI had the Camden group completely covered. They were ready. When they, they waited until everybody got the building, they, wait, you know, they had the names and addresses of the support people. The whole deal. Uh, in our case, the party had heard something, that something might be happening in Buffalo. That's all they had. That night, uh, two guys, two FBI agents, surprised us by coming up the elevator. They had Bermuda shorts on and flip-flops. They were coming from a party. They were not really expecting to find us, any more than we were expecting to see them. No, it was a head office. Well, yeah, they were checking out the building just on the tip, on the, on the possibility that something was going down in Buffalo, that night, in the building. They didn't know where we were. And one of us didn't duck. Well, we didn't. We didn't duck. We were spotted. And I don't know who. Why they never arrested me? They didn't have any evidence. Uh, came to my house. Did I say again? They came to my house that night. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, I know. There was there was stuff like that. Sure. Well, I think they, you know, Mike, the, Mike and Jim were the chairman of it to uh, volunteer. <laughs> You're guilty. Because they were guilty. And they were eager to uh, do what we were doing. They wanted to speak about it and stuff. And different times. Wow. They did stand up and say claim responsibility. They said they, they, they'd been there. But was, all they found were two extra pair of pants. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if you've heard the story of Mike or not, but uh, these are two, two white guys who somehow scaled a wrought iron fence <laughs> and got out the side door of this building and ran in their underwear down the east side uh, looking for help. <laughs> and the east side was not. You know, it's rough territory, you know. Especially for two white guys running in our way. And I think Mike, Mike had a watch and used it as as a, convince somebody to drive them to uh, the West Side. Just in terms in terms of Mike presenting his guilt, I can remember at the trial and that would happen, everybody else would That's stand right. up and say, yeah, I was there. Petty, petty. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a Spartacus thing. Yeah. You, you don't get shuffled out of the building and then you yeah. get back in. It was very frustrating for my thing. The gyms were. They were just better climbers. Well, I don't know if you remember, um, I had two roles that night. And uh, one of them was to, to drive a car because uh, there was some concern in the group uh, about the noise getting to the outside. As if you, I don't know if you had drills or something like that. And uh, so the parking lot across from the building, um, the upper level looked right into. And uh, so I was to wait for um, a signal coming from your building to the parking lot uh, to then take my car down in front of the building and push on the horn as long as I could. And uh, so I was looking and looking and <laughs> finally after quite a while, which I thought beyond the time when you were going to try and use the drills, so I went down in front of the, the uh, fire station there and uh, just, just uh, honking the horn for as long as I could until they, they came speak. out. And so I just had my fingers crossed that it worked, that, uh, that it drowned out what was going on inside. 
the other other uh, task that I had was to drive the well, the, in the old term of the getaway car, but the, the van uh, to carry all the uh, over Grand Island, and uh, so I had I had gone back to Grand Island after the horn hawking and uh, and waited to about the time that we had set about in, uh, in the morning. Came back as I was turning the street there. I saw it surrounded by about 50 cars. Yeah. And I said, I think I'd better get up here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I wanted to ask about the Catholic connection. And yeah. your group is the word Catholic. And you know, when I think about like the local diocese, I don't <laughs> see them supporting connections like this. So what was what was that all about? Well, it, it went back to uh, the Baritons, really. They were they were uh, you know, figureheads, and the early actions were did involve a lot of priests, nuns, ex-priests, ex-nuns, and, and, and we were called Catholic lady. It, it, it was a, a Catholic move. No question about it, but it wasn't approved by any diocese. <laughs> they weren't even close. I mean, even the Jetties would have had trouble with it. And they did. You know, Dan was a Jesuit, and, and, and Phil was a, a uh, Josephine. And their orders were not too friendly. Although that changed too over the years. So it was not, it was certainly not an official part of the church. And, and it really put the church on notice for a lot of things. Is this organization still exist? Or never an organization, more like an organism. <laughs> and it exists as you see it on that clip and here. You know, it exists in memory, and that's part of why I wanted to do this was to just remind people about this forgotten history. When I saw those clips about boom, 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 you know, this city, that's I forgot. I didn't know a whole bunch of those actually had taken place. People really missed a lot of that. Now we've got Howard Zinn and Chomsky and all that stuff saying, yeah, we haven't talked. But it's better now. I'm just glad to be able to uh, let people know more personal about this. It was never a movement. We were really square. I mean, it was awful. The <laughs> Catholic thing, getting tagged with the Catholic thing. You know, schools, college kids. <laughs> What's this? You know, Quakers. Yeah. Religious people just weren't cool in 1968. Uh, I have to also say that none of us really took the Catholic thing real deeply seriously in terms of our conscience. We were, we were you know, 20, 26, and it was a youth thing. And part of the appeal of the Buffalo action for me was that we didn't stand around because I thought that was square too. And the, counter, uh, the idea was to get away and do it again. You know, it was a and other people, you know, other people uh, stuck around. So the the tactics that kind of mutated. The, the bottom line is it was nonviolent. Jeremiah, I think you're really right. I mean, your your script is is beautiful and and very important. Uh, the uh, George Michi, uh, was just on that. Um, was recently in Buffalo, uh, well, maybe it's close to a year now, but um, he's trying to do the same thing, uh, not only about what he was involved with, but a lot of others around the country. Um, and going back even you know, before the Vietnam War, and then afterwards, trying to bring all that together, um, and uh, I, I think that's very important. So I uh, congratulate you on uh, putting that together, and, and hopefully even more. Well, in this five chapters. I'll be back. Yes. Two questions. Uh, what effect did your participation in this trial and the action that you took have on your wife long term? And secondly, uh, okay, so we've done away with the draft. 
uh, except for the economic conscription that exists in this country. And how has that affected how you responded to the Iraq and Afghanistan war, and how the people in this room responded to the Iraq and Afghanistan war, or did not respond to it? I, uh, obviously, the, the, the action shaped a whole lot of my early days. I had, I had two children, both of them much older than I was. Uh, I couldn't continue just by being a radical. It wasn't, even though, I have to say, I thought doing what I did was like a smart career. One day, I really did things. You know, people would figure out that we were we were right, and everybody else was wrong. You know, certainly, the government. You know, they'd all go to jail, and we'd be served. <laughs> so I got into newspapers, which was my dad's work. And as I think I mentioned in my note to you, uh, when Bruce came back from from uh, Sweden, well, with peace bridge, right? I, I'm not mistaken about this. Uh, I was a reporter for the Niagara Gazette and I covered the I covered this return. Hi Bruce. I thought we hadn't met. You know, I just I was I'm sure the story was twelve inches of water. You know, uh, you know, it was just my old who what where went on. But I was happy that I And that was my, that's been my life. Uh, straight. Most uh, of And as far as I describe myself now, politically, as a wild eyed moderate. I mean, really, I'm a wild eyed moderate. You know, I'm not really what I was. I never find a way to, uh, to be that way. Other than my principles still apply, but I was never. Being a public person, I wasn't going to do more actions. Um, when I was 20, I was tired of mass demonstrations. Uh, that's why I got into the young To me, it, when I was 20, it looked like this to be the mass movements, demonstrations, protests, or something like that. Uh, you know, neither of them were. So I guess it's at stake not mine, but also.
pictures of the postcards. This is 07. And boom, we got this huge reaction. TV, we did a TBS and Tokyo Broadcast and CBS and NBC. They all wanted to know about the real Irish movie. And it turned into a great story because the guy himself, the was a reporter for man. We wound up taking these letters over to Tokyo and presenting them to the survivors that had been mentioned to whom the letters had been sent, but they never forwarded. He'd written them and collected them. They were back and forth in that correspondence. And uh, we were able to give it to his younger brother, who was then 80 years old, died of cancer. And it was a wonderful story, a wonderful event, in which we were so connected to, to his niece, to the back. Long story short, every war story I've ever done in the newspapers turned out to be an anti-war story. And it to be an anti -war story. That's a special. You know, Blue Jays got that's in trouble. Yeah, sure you like that. Yeah. That's a long one. Uh, we can just break up now and hug each other. <laughs> Thank you.